So hello everybody, welcome to Plaque Stage Pass Episode 2, um, the companion series to Plaque to the Future. Um, and in this episode we're going to be uh, talking to Steve, who is an author and heritage curator and consultant. Heritage consultant and curator, he's got so many titles, it's just incredible. Um, who is going to talk to us a bit more about Ira Aldridge, who, of course, we focus on in episode two of Plaque to the Future. Um, Steve, I don't know if you would also like to introduce yourself in a in a way that's m better. <laughs> well, ve very briefly, thanks for the opportunity. Um, yes, I mean, I'm a writer, I'm a researcher, I curate exhibitions, I do all sorts of business in the heritage sector, basically looking at the histories of uh, particularly people of African origin in Britain, British history, but before 1948. So any time before 1948, that's the period I'm really looking at. Okay, I won't ask you anything about anything after 1948. Um, <laughs> I, will, I won't even go there. Um, so uh, yeah, did I introduce myself? I'm Imogen. And I am the writer and director of Plank to the Future, um, if you didn't know already. Um, so just to, to kick things off, uh, I wanted to talk about um, the industry that Ira was working in uh, more generally. So obviously theatre, predominantly in, in the UK that his, his career was based, um, sort of throughout the 1800s. What did that sort of industry look like at the time? Um, and, and how did how did Ira sort of slot into that? Well, it was just such a bizarre situation that Ira finds himself, as you say, slotting into and ultimately dominating. Because in a sense, you really came from nowhere into a very fixed, a very formalised uh, theatre world, London theatre world. You know, there are specific theatres for doing classic uh, performances. There were others for doing all sorts of performance, uh, you know, more pantomimish performances and entertainments. And Ira comes in um, in what, 1825 and he's 18. He's 18 years old and he's coming as an 18 year old, as we'd now say, African American into a theatre or a world of performance which has only really experienced people who look like him and like me as freaks, really. The, he's still just um, at the time of freak shows. Just before him, you've had what, Sarchi Bartman, the famous hot and top Venus, who was studied because of her big behind. Um, you had George Grattan, piebald boy, who died at five years old. He had um, uneven pigmentation, vitiligo on his skin. He was a human exhibit. Um, before that, there'd been Amelia Newsom, who was an albino. Basically, people who looked like Ira were seen as curiosities, were seen as freaks. There was literally no real place for them on the stage. And towards the end of Ira's career, you see the growth of uh, like blackface minstrelsy, other ways of looking at uh, black people, particularly African-Americans on stage where you have white performers uh, painting their face with burnt cork and performing a lot of very sentimental, racist <laughs> depictions of black people, uh, enslaved black people, you know, which became very, very popular and were a, a form of entertainment, which was enjoyed by British audiences for, well, up until the 1970s on television. So Ira Aldridge really comes from nowhere um, to the British stage, which isn't ready for him at all, but he dominates it. And in terms of, I, I mean, he's obviously, as we've said, really young when he decided to come over to the UK to sort of pursue that that career. And the way you've described it, it sounds absolutely terrifying to make that decision to to still go into that into that world. But was there something about um, the kind of artistic culture in the UK that? that made that a, a bit more of a possibility for him that kind of helped him make that decision to to make the journey over to London? Yes, very much so. I mean, it was, in a sense, it was perfect for him because we can't get away from the fact that here was someone who didn't just uh, create and bring, give life to um, dramatic characters. 
um, on the uh, on the page and on the stage, but he also could create himself. Remember, he's eighteen and he's coming from um, New York, a place where he, as a young black man, cannot uh, have a successful or a thriving career as an actor, and he would have been aware of the possibilities on the English stage because he was already in communication with English actors like the Wallach brothers, um, who were associates of his in New York. He would know that here is a place he would have uh, measurably greater social mobility and uh, possibility of a career trajectory. So also it was a place where he could create himself, which is something he did throughout his life. It's one of the more in as interesting as his stage career, I think. Going into that world and creating a career for himself, were there other examples? I, I know you mentioned a few yeah. earlier, um, but other examples in, in the theatre industry in the UK and also around the world of, of performers of colour sort of trying to, to make that new ground and, and sort of reinvent how people saw um, mm. people of colour on stage? Some people attempted it, but they, mostly this happened towards you know, the middle to the end of his career. Um, because as I said, you did see that huge, after say 1848, um, you see the uptake of the appetite for um, plantation stories, you know, south, you know, from the American South, um, um, Uncle Tom's Cabin becomes popular, but you don't really see anyone doing what um, Ira Aldridge has done until 1860, 1862, when you have Morgan Smith, and he's an African-American, another African-American performer, and he takes up the role of Othello. Um, so you don't really see anyone else in between. You have people like um, William Henry Lane, who was a freeborn black man from Rhode Island, who arrived um, in London in 1848. And he was one of the precursors of um, minstrelsy. And he was a black performer who was observed by Dickens. Dickens loved, you know, just the way he moved and played the tambourine, etc. cetera. But um, for high profile performers doing what Aldridge did. No, he wasn't just um, a forerunner. And remember as well, he wasn't just the first um, African-American performer. He was the first American <laughs> performer, you know, to arrive on uh, the English stage and to get the profile he did. So not many other people were anywhere um, near to, you know, taking on that baton or following on. Yeah. And um, um, were... I don't know how much insight you'd ha you'd have into this, but um, obviously dealing with any accents that weren't sort of the st standard English would have been quite difficult for for audiences at, at the time, and arguably like the theatre industry it can still be quite snobby about oh, yes. what accents are used in particularly Shakespearean plays now. Um, so speaking with an American accent, how how was that received? Well, through his career, he developed, obviously, this is where he lived for most of his life. So his you know, accent uh, was just more, um, um, in, it was just uh, more approaching, you know, uh, received pronunciation of the period. But um, he did arrive here with a distinct uh, American accent. And that was something which was picked up throughout his career from his earliest performances uh, interesting, the first performance he had was in May 1825 in East London Royalty Theatre as Othello, which is interesting in itself. But there, um, even from that first introduction to the stage, his critics mentioned uh, some of the difficulties he had pronouncing uh, some of um, um, the Bard's writing, and particularly, you know, 1833, when he plays um, at the Covent Garden Theatre, Othello, um, for that brief period, um, one of the uh, barbs which was used against him was the fact that you know he couldn't properly enunciate Shakespearean language as audiences um, would have been used to it. However, he was quite popular with the general population because you know you think for the 1830s, this is the beginning of the 1830s. This is when the um, Emancipation Bill is moving through Parliament. There are a lot of vested interests 
who really don't want to see someone like Ira Aldridge uh, on their principal stages playing principal Shakespearean roles, especially that of a black man who you know is going to work violence on Desdemona, you know, a white woman within that play. So yeah, he upset a lot of the critics, but um, he did have um, some uh, popular appeal. And I think one thing that I was quite aware of when I was researching for, for for writing the episode was was the difference between the reception that he got from the critics um, and the reception he got from just ge general public audiences, um, and that was that was mainly due to obviously the critics being um, paid by by people in positions that that wouldn't have have been for the abolition of, of slavery. Yeah, very much the viewpoints mirror those of um, the Uber establishment, if you will. You, you have to remember that the movement for um, abolition, basically the anti-slavery movement, was the first genuine uh, mass movement in British history. You had people of all ranks who were against it, including uh, women as well, which was another contested issue. But um, there was um, a huge body of public opinion. The larger body of public opinion was overwhelmingly against buying and selling people. Um, but, um, and also they were receptive to um, Aldridge's, you know, not just his depictions, brings this sort of authenticity, if that was appropriate, to these black roles, but also his habit of, um, on the last night of any of his performance, on the closing nights, the last night, he was, um, his audience knew, grew to expect um, a little bit of oratory or a declamation, usually about uh, anti-slavery, about human dignity, about uh, the humanity of uh, African people. Um, this is part of what he did and what some of his audiences would have gone to expect. And um, yes, that would definitely have rubbed the status quo up the wrong way. Yeah, he was very actively involved in in, in sharing the views of, of the time, and um, yeah, getting getting the message out to audiences as much yes. as possible. Um, and there were sort of uh, there were other kind of shows that he was involved in that were also part of that that anti slavery movement. Yes, I mean, a lot of his performances, um, I mean, lots of them, some of them you could say were stereotyped because um, they weren't written uh, by or for uh, black people, but they were written about black people or black characters um, by white playwrights. Um, what you got, he played in the role of a Three Fingered Jack or OB. About an, that's a, basically a pantomime about an escaped slave. Um, famously, um, Orinoco, um, The Revenge or Revolt in Suriname. Um, what else? Mungo in Vicar Staff's The Padlock. Um, all of these were um, uh, presentations based around enslavement, and Aldridge took those central roles. And, you know, they're full of stereotypes and stuff which would make us howl nowadays, but we are talking um, 200 years ago. <laughs> and it was uh, very much to the taste of the time, and he did give these things a special spin. And that was one of the things he actually, you know, made a living out of in this country, you know, until he sought his fortune elsewhere. Yeah, I think I Ira is possibly the best example in the series, actually, of, of using... Your platform to directly sway people to to thinking in in a in a more hmm. expansive way. Um, and, I, and, and know, it, yeah, because I, I think it's just such a radical thing that he's doing as well. You know, he comes out of nowhere. This is a first, and um, he is playing the part of black characters. He, because the British audiences are accustomed, they're used to seeing um, black characters being played by uh, white men in blackface, quite literally. And moreover, he goes a step further 
when he goes to depict um, Shylock, Lear, Macbeth, um, in whiteface, <laughs> you know, he's really taking the audience on a journey they have not been on before, <laughs> definitely. And, and remember, this is also happening at a time when you have the blackface entertainment minstrelsy phenomenon coming up uh, in sort of terms, to put it very crudely and wrongly, perhaps, as in low, t low culture terms, but in high culture terms, in terms of um, Shakespearean characters, high characters being depicted, you have um, Ira Aldridge here, an African-American in whiteface. So, you know, responding to this. And I think it, it definitely instilled a, a passion for him to, to try and push that as far as possible. He obviously went on and, and toured. Um, how easy would that have been at the time for for an actor? I can't, I don't know if he he he's kind of toured solo, um, or whether he went with a a troupe. But um, how easy how easy would that have been uh, at the time for for an actor to go on tour? It would have been difficult. It would have been awkward, especially that, remember. Um, for example, eighteen fifty two, he has his uh, first big tour. Um, starting out of Europe, this is, and he goes to, starts off in Brussels, he's in Cologne, Berlin, Leipzig, Dresden, Krakow. Uh, he doesn't speak any of these languages well, <laughs> and especially going through the empire, um, he has to have a German translator. Um, but he is rapturously received. Um, it would have been very, very difficult for someone of a lower profile to have had such extraordinary success as um, a performing artist, as a, sorry, rather as um, a musician, it would have been much easier universal language. But here he is not just uh, uh, practically, mono, effectively monoglot, one, you know, speaks one language, um, but he's playing to multiple audiences across Europe when English was not as widespread as it is now. So um, in a sense, he's really establishing his position as one of the great Shakespearean delineators because simply on the emotive level, as well as all sorts of, we can imagine the laughingly clunky um, Central European Germanic <laughs> translations of um, Lear and Macbeth, it, it, he's doing something really quite powerful here. And very, very interesting, um, but yes, it, he wouldn't have found it easy at all, but um, he was received uh, such incredible acclaim, uh, rapturous acclaim. And um, yes, I mean, this is really where he made his mark. And I think in terms of his career uh, is where he had what you could say was uh, his spiritual home. He was, um, he, he was adored in continental Europe. Yeah, I, I was going to ask you about um, how he was received because um, he was, the, I think, the, the first performer to take Shakespeare to, to the Russian provinces um, yes. sort of flat out, um, which is quite a weight to have on your shoulders um, to sort of carry that, that kind of work for the first time. Um, so, yeah, I mean, lots of honours and things came he, that, that, for that him out of that. Absolutely, absolutely loved him. I mean, in Russia, for example, um, one uh, theatre critic wrote about how it's impossible to see Othello performed by a white actor, uh, be it Garrick himself, you know, earlier century, uh, the, one of the great Shakespearean uh, actors. But um, people were flabbergasted uh, to see not just a black actor, but a black actor playing Othello, um, uh, Shylock, uh, Richard III, all of the, um, the great roles. And um, there was a famous cartoon f um, going around Prague showing um, the Estates Theatre uh, in two states, two, the, the before Aldridge and the after Aldridge. The before Aldridge uh, Theatre is shown as being overrun with rats and fly, you know, fly blown, windswept. <laughs> the post Aldridge, you know, after his arrival, you know, it shows uh, a queues lining up around the corner of the theatre. Um, here's someone who was very, very popular, and you know, inevitably that's where he went on to enjoy success uh, throughout the rest of his life, which gave him a 
pretty nice living as well in South yeah. London. And 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 by this point, particularly when he was touring, was he still using the stage name Keaton, or, or had had he dropped that by this point? Oh, he he had dropped that, and he realised <laughs> he dropped the name Keen, and he also. Um, started to edge a bit more into reality away from describing himself as um uh, of senegalese background you know masquerading under one of the you know these princely titles and you know sort of aristocratic um armor which a lot of um uh uh, uh african people african origin people in britain would often use as a sort of class defense so um yeah, I mean, he was becoming more a person he actually was. Yeah. It wasn't, it wasn't uh, always a very nice one, but <laughs> an, an authentic one. Yeah. Um, and, and you mentioned um, that the house that he, he ended up moving into in London, which is obviously where his blue plaque can be found now. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about just the, the, the part of his life that, that was centred around that building and what sort of happened in his life during that time? Yes, um, this is where he was more or less settled um, as finally a family man <laughs> after uh, numerous adventures. Remember, he first marries, what, 1825 or 6, I think. But he marries, uh, actually, in 26, as a 19-year-old. And his first wife, Margaret Gale, is 10 years his senior. They don't have any children between them, but they have remained married for, like, 40 years or something. A 40 year marriage during which he does have children with other parties, but he finally um, marries uh, Miss Brandt, Amanda Brandt, who masqueraded again as a Swedish countess. She was not. <laughs> and um, they uh, had four children, all of whom, with one exception, had quite tragic lives. Uh, subject for a whole other, you know, <laughs> series. Um, but they had middle class lives. Um, they're in uh, their multi leveled home in uh, Hamlet Road, just close to uh, Crystal Palace. And um, that's where he returned to, um, to his nice family home. Of course, there must have been all sorts of drama with his children uh, being educated and um, having to live uh, fairly isolated lives in the South London of that period. But um, it was the most, most settled uh, part, period of, of his life. And I mean, just sort of bringing, bringing his kind of story to, to, to a close, sort of what, what do you think his, for him, his greatest achievements were because obviously that taking on that role of Othello in in Covent Garden w was um, extremely major but it was also just the result of someone being unwell and not being able to to portray the character so what do you think for him at the time would have been the, the main thing that he was proud yeah. of? Oh, speak to speak for him, I would say that. Yes, uh, speak for him, please. Yeah. Uh, I would sort of channel him. <laughs> <laughs> I would say that um, it was probably the Othello performances of 1833 because they were totally groundbreaking, totally radical, and um, they just put him firmly amongst that um, number of uh, great Shakespearean actors who, again, no pun intended, set the tone for uh, how, you know, if you go to Stratford and Avon, you know, he is amongst the, you know, the handful of three or four greats. And um, he also opened the doors as well for other black actors, for black people in, um, I hate to use the word, um, the less popular parts of theatre and performance. And uh, he was doing it in a, at a time when depictions um, of popular depictions of uh, particularly African-Americans, but black people in general, were utterly stereotypical and um, humiliating and sentimental at best. Um, so he, what he was doing was bringing dignity where 
uh, dignity was you know, a very, very rare commodity. At the well, thank you for channeling him there. I will now ask you to channel yourself for the final fun question, which is if you could be on a phone call with Ira Aldridge as the lead character is in, in our series, what would you ask him or tell him? I would ask him how he did it. I would want to know how he managed to get away with it, not by his creations on the stage, but the, his own self-creation, where he got the confidence from, the gall, <laughs> the audacity, in, in sometimes a downright cheek, to um, pull off that greatest act, which was himself, whether that was masquerading as um, a Senegalese prince, whether it was claiming that both his wives had aristocratic birth, um, how did he do that and how did he sustain that? Um, that's what I'd really, I'd ask him more about himself um, and all of those defenses that he had to summon and uh, draw upon and harness just to make it through every single day. The extraordinary decisions he'd have to make. Yeah, still, yeah, absolutely mind blowing and, and incredible. Um, thank you so much for speaking to me, to me today and sort of offering up more information um, for everyone who's who's been enjoying the, the series. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Pleasure. And um, My pleasure, Imogen. Yeah, it's it's been really wonderful to, to speak to you. And don't forget, everyone, to watch the next episode of Planet of the Future, where we focus on the Jewish scientist, Hertha Ayrton. Mm -hmm.